so um, a very short version kind of like of the title, like in order to give you a better understanding what the talk will be about is, so if you ever wanted to do patch reconstruction and having non-smooth regularization, then there are kind of like basically no real fast algorithms available in the literature. And so this work uh, tries to aim to fill this gap. So this is joint work with a couple of mathematicians from around the world. So from with um, uh, Anton Chambord from Paris, Peter Richterick, who's now in Saudi Arabia at Kaus, and Carol Schoening from Cambridge. And the PET imaging side is with uh, collaborators from UCL, Pavel Makiewicz, and Jonathan Schott. So this is a quick outline of the talk. So the talk will have three parts. So the first part is the motivation. So if we want to do a uh, PET reconstruction with non-smooth uh, regularizers, then we can do this via optimization. So then we will derive that we, in general, want to uh, minimize a function of this form. Then the second part is then actually about how to do this in practice, so like, uh, so like how to have an efficient algorithm that can s solve such optimization problems. And here we will focus particularly on randomized uh, uh, um, uh, or ran randomization to make it faster. And so two aspects which are very important here is, so on the one hand, these functions f, i, and g, so they might be not smooth or kind of like not smooth enough for like methods like, like gradient descent. And the second problem that we often encounter in practice is that in order to evaluate these uh, linear operators, bi, that this can be very expensive. So we want to have an algorithm that uh, minimally computes uh, kind of like bi applied to x. And then finally, um, we will evaluate this uh, on clinical PET imaging. So if you want to do PET reconstruction with uh, non-smooth priors, uh, like the most common way to do this nowadays is uh, with variational regularization, meaning that on the one hand we have a data fit, which is now here is the kubik leiber divergence, there's, there's a formula on there. And then uh, in addition, we then also add some regularization to it, which has like certain, certain like uh, smoothness or like piecewise smoothness uh, we want to have in our solution. And in addition, we have constraints for our solutions, so like the tracer should be like non-negative. And so often when people write down the kubek leiber divergence, they often only write down the top part of the formula, which is the smooth part. However, actually when you want to do convex optimization, so usually like everything needs to be fine on entire vector space. So actually you also like need to include kind of constraints into the kubek leiber divergence. And uh, so if you're a bit more mathematically inclined, then you can see that like the top part, yes, it's smooth. However, it's, uh, its gradient is not ellipsis continuous. So kind of it's not really smooth enough for gradient descent. Then we have constraints, uh, for instance, in, uh, in the form of the uh, non-negativity constraint, and then we have regularizers. For instance, in the, uh, very popular regularizer would be the total variation. But then, as I said uh, before, kind of like this talk is about uh, anatomically regularized uh, pet reconstruction. So like one question is um, how to incorporate the information from MRI into the regularizer. And so like this framework has been used uh, kind of like dozens or hundreds of times in literature. So I'm now citing here maybe like 10, 15 references here at the bottom, but there are like many, many more who use this model. So one way how to include uh, MRI information into the pet reconstruction is by the directional total variation. And the uh, idea for the directional total variation goes back to the idea of uh, what I call the parallel sets idea. So if you want to compare PET and MRI images, obviously the, uh, the image values are very different. So we wouldn't want to compare a PET image and an MRI image kind of like on the image intensities. Um, but therefore, kind of like instead, we then go from the MRI image here at the top left uh, to kind of like to a vector field that I indicate now here in this, in this rainbow color plot uh, at the top, where instead of only looking at the intensities, so we look at gradient directions and gradient magnitudes. So like uh, this, uh, if, you, if you wish, kind of like is, an, is an edge indicator map, but then in addition also that kind of tells us about the direction of these gradients. And so we say that kind of like two images, U and V, are similar in the sense of parallel set. So if their spatial gradients are actually parallel or collinear, and this is the case if and only if the last uh, equation holds. And so uh, based on this idea, then you can uh, try to write down a prior that would be minimal if two images have actually parallel sets, and that's what we call the directional total variation, which is basically uh, kind of like the normal total variation, but then kind of like for every pixel or voxel location, you have uh, a small like three by three metric uh, in front of it, which weights different directions. 
And uh, so this idea, exactly in this form, kind of like has been proposed by myself and Martha back in 2016. But kind of like some of these ideas like uh, date uh, back to Byram and Kamazak in 2012. And uh, some other bits even go back to Yari Kaipio and co-workers from 1999. If this vector field is actually constant zero, then this formulation is exactly the total variation. So like it's, it's a direct generalization of the total variation. Um, but then in practice, kind of like we're not so much interested when the vector field is zero, we are actually interested when the vector field is non-zero. And what we often use is this formulation here at the, um, at the bottom, where the vector field is basically uh, kind of like a normalized gradient field of the MRI image. So if we now put this regularizer back into our variational uh, regularization approach, then uh, this is the uh, problem that we want to minimize. So here also, in addition, we kind of like um, have reformulated the pet uh, data term in terms of some like subsets. So like if this is all your pet data, kind of like what we now here do in practice, that we take different views of this, of this pet data and group this all the subsets, kind of, kind of like this, this blue line here will be like one subset, the red line another one, and then the green line another one. And these subsets kind of like they are constant over all the sinograms in the pet data set. So this, this will be kind of, kind of like a uh, useful thing for our computational approach. And but now kind of like how we group uh, the data into subsets is actually a parameter of the algorithm itself. So we, we use something like this type of, uh, of grouping, but you could, you could use other, uh, other groupings if you want. Uh, but even with this grouping, you can then sti still choose something like the number of subsets, which are now denoted by uh, this, per uh, this number uh, lowercase m here. And we will tweak this later on to see what are the best m's to choose. So now uh, this, uh, this pet reconstruction um, problem can now be cast into the general optimization problem that I shown you earlier. Um, and then there are multiple ways, kind of like how to map this problem into this problem. This one is the one that I've chosen. Um, I'm not claiming that this one is the best one, but I uh, just want to show you kind of like that there exists a mapping from here to here. Uh, and then kind of like it's, a, it's an open debate, kind of like how to do this mapping best in practice. So then what are the issues in practice? So like on the one hand, as I said, kind of like FIs and Gs, they are either non-smooth or not smooth enough. However, what all of these functions that I shown you on the previous slide uh, have in common that their proximal operator can actually be, uh, be uh, being uh, computed um, analytically. So like this is something like a gradient, but like a, like, a, like, a, like, a, like a generalized gradient. However, we cannot efficiently compute the proximal operator if we compose these FIs, these non-smooth parts, with our linear operators. So we can compute the proximal operator for only for f, but not if we compose it with the bi. So we need to split these two things apart. And then also, as I said before, kind of like uh, a common problem in PET imaging is that to compute uh, metric vector products is very expensive. I mean, as the CIs are usually also not even given as matrices, but just like as black box operators. Great. So how can this be done? Um, so there exists a very popular algorithm that can actually can solve this problem that I've shown you on the previous slide. And this is called the primal dual hybrid gradient, also known as the Schumbold Pock algorithm. And so I'm now show you here kind of like the algorithm for the special case of exactly the problem uh, that we had before, where kind of like we had all the uh, all the sum over all the all the all the composed uh, parts f i and b. And so then the algorithm reads like this, and basically kind of like it has three simple steps. So first we need to uh, initialize all our iterates. Okay, that's easy. Um, and then we do an update with respect to x, which we then call the primal variable. And for this update, we basically need to compute kind of like all the transpose of all the bi applied to uh, some dual variable uh, yi. Then we need to sum over them. Then we have a step size here. And this is now not a scalar step size, but it's a matrix value step size. Uh, so this is kind of like, um, computation is a bit expensive. And so then we compute the prox operator of g, and then uh, we have get our update for x. Our update for y basically looks the same, uh, and we need to do this kind of like for all the i's. Come here, we need to compute all the all the adjoints for all the i's, and here we need to compute the forward operator for all the i's. And then finally, we do some extrapolation. Um, so in the second part, we have the evaluation of the bi and bi adjoint, the proximal operator, and then uh, there are several conversion theorems for this algorithm. And the simplest one being that if you choose this extrapolation uh, constant to, to one and you form matrices of this kind. Uh, this might look a bit strange, but like, it doesn't really matter now. But like, and, and then you stack these matrices into a big matrix, and then you compute the, uh, the matrix norm of this. 
and this needs to be upper bounded by one. And under, the, under these conditions, this algorithm will actually converge to a solution of the problem that you wanted to compute. And as I said before, kind of like, so two big problems here are that we need to compute all these uh, four operators and they're adjoined in each iteration. So in, in order to kind of like overcome this problem, kind of like a fairly naive idea is, let's do the first step as before, but then for the second step, we don't actually do that, uh, but we only choose a random index j at each iteration differently, uh, and then only kind of like update the dual variables that correspond to this j, and leave everything else untouched. And then also when we, when we do the extrapolation, we then only do the extrapolation uh, in the variable uh, for like i equal to the selected j. And when you do the mathematical analysis uh, for this algorithm, then uh, you can see that it is better or it is uh, easier to kind of like do a different extrapolation compared to what we had before. So before we had this extrapolation only with theta, now we have it with theta over pi. And this kind of like uh, corresponds to having like an unbiased uh, update of this extrapolation. Um, this algorithm is fairly general, so like you can choose kind of like any probabilities how to choose any of these indices. The only thing what is important is that in each iteration we need to have kind of the same random procedure underlying it, and the probability that each index is being selected in each iteration needs to be positive, otherwise we will never be able to improve convergence to the same problem. And while I've shown you this formulation of the algorithm, uh, here in this formulation we still will compute all the adjoints of all the vi's, but actually uh, with slight more, slightly more complicated formulas uh, as we have like in the paper, uh, uh, one can kind of, kind of like reformulate this algorithm in a way such, such that you can, you can compute this one by only computing vi adjoint for the i which is being, uh, being selected plus a little bit of memory storage. So therefore we have now a new algorithm which in each iteration only computes vi and vi adjoint for the selected index i. So like potentially then every iteration is faster. So what can we say about the convergence? So because we have this very general framework that these uh, fi's and g's can be non-smooth, um, the convergence statements need to be a little bit more complicated so we can prove convergence in what's called the Breckmann distance. Uh, I don't want to go into too much detail what the Breckmann distance is, but like somehow it's a distance which is kind of being derived by the function itself that we want to minimize. So like depending on the properties of the function, our Breckmann distance will have more or less uh, information. So then what can we say about the convergence of this algorithm? So uh, when, uh, if x sharp and y sharp is, uh, is a saddle point, or like, like if like x sharp is a solution to our original problem, and then theta is chosen to be equal to one, and the step size are chosen in this way, and now this looks a bit similar to what I've shown you uh, before. Kind of like this corresponds to that, basically that the, uh, that the norm over the ci's individually needs to be upper bounded by the probability of, an, of the index i to be selected. Then we can prove that almost surely the iterates converge in the Breckmann distance to uh, the solution. And now highlighted here in red are the, are the two parts which kind of like the theorem for this algorithm is different compared to the theorem for the original deterministic algorithm. So like the uh, deterministic algorithm, for instance, you can, you, you can think about choosing n equal to one and the probability equal to one, then kind of like this condition is exactly the same condition that we had before, and then this uh, convergence in the Breckmann distance then obviously will hold not on, uh, only almost surely, but surely. Um, sorry? Oh, so sorry, so almost surely kind of like means with probability one. So it's like very, very, very unlikely, but like in theory possible that this algorithm will not converge. So with, with probability one, it will converge but there might be outliers where uh, you have very strange things happening uh, that like you're kind of like only, only with probability zero are, are, are about to observe. And so like only in those cases, kind of like would this algorithm not converge? So, so like, in, like in practice, this will always converge, but obviously kind of like if the, for the original algorithm, there's no random procedure in there. So kind of like these other things will literally never happen. And so in this algorithm, they will only happen with pro probability zero. Great, so, but then also um, uh, before here, so we had these uh, matrix value step sizes. And again, like it's a fairly abstract condition. So what are possible step sizes that fulfill these, uh, these conditions? So on the one hand, there are scalar step sizes when you choose kind of like a SI equal to be like a, um, like a, like a uh, proportional to the identity with certain, with certain values. 
then the set uh, size condition is fulfilled. And this is kind of like what most people choose in practice uh, nowadays. And but then in addition, what we also proved, and it's actually like quite interesting. So if the uh, if the bi's are non-negative, meaning that all its elements are non-negative, then we, uh, you can also have actually matrix value step size or like vector value step size, like it's a it's a diagonal matrix. Uh, and so on the diagonal is the inverse of the projection of ones or the back projection of ones. And this is kind of a little bit related to kind of like step sizes that are being chosen in MLEM, for instance. And so how do these um, uh, matrix value step sizes look in practice? So kind of like this one here is now the projection of ones, so kind of like it lives in the data space. So kind of like then the projection of ones and kind of like this, this diagonal has the same dimensions as, an, uh, as our, our data set. So we can kind of like unroll it and like view it as uh, a sinogram. And as we can see, kind of like in the areas of the sinogram where a lot of stuff is happening, there the step size is large. In the areas which are kind of fairly boring, the step size is small. And likewise for the uh, for the step sizes ti, uh, also here, kind of like with the back, back projection of ones, kind of like ins uh, inside our, our brain, we have actually large step sizes. Outside, we have small step sizes. Great. Let's look at some applications. So first of all, now we had a, a random algorithm and a non-random algorithm which are supposed to compute the same thing. How, so, but like now the theory told us, yes, they do compute the same thing, but like let's verify in practice whether that will actually happen. So at the top, you can see the deterministic parameter Herbert gradient uh, after 5,000 iterations. At the bottom, you can see the randomized algorithm only after 20 epochs. One epoch is kind of like a machine learning terminology means that kind of like on average, the, we have touched every data point once. So kind of like one epoch basically corresponds to the computational effort of one iteration here. And so, uh, yeah, as you can see here, that both images basically look the same, so it's good. Our randomized algorithm computes the same thing as the non-randomized one. Um, but then let's look at some, uh, some quantitative uh, speed measurements and also kind of like there were a, a couple of parameters, kind of like how should we choose those. So like one, one of them was uh, the number of subsets. And uh, so now here there are kind of like four different graphs and some of them are hardly visible, okay? So kind of like here in yellow is this line that you can hardly see, is the uh, non-random algorithm. Then there is a graph, the next one is this one here, which is a random algorithm with 21 subsets. And then kind of like as the shade of green gets darker, we choose more and more subsets. And as you can see here, so like this now with respect to the peak signal to noise ratio to the minimizer. So we want this curve to be as large as possible, as quickly as possible. And as you can see, kind of like all four curves are layered meaning as you increase the number of subsets, the algorithm gets faster. And likewise, because we want to minimize a certain objective, so here we want to go down as fast as possible. And again, you can see all four curves are layered. So as we increase the number of subsets, the algorithm gets faster and faster. Second, uh, so I said before, kind of we can choose any uh, type of pro probabilities uh, um, uh, in the algorithm and it will always converge. Nevertheless, the, those probabilities might affect the speed of convergence. Um, so here now we compare two different samplings, one being uniform sampling, we choose kind of like all the different operators uh, with probability one over n, and the other one is we choose kind of like with probability a half between data and regularizer, and then uh, among the data we again choose everything with uniform probability, and like the basic take home message here is, uh, I, think, uh, I don't really have, uh, have time to like, explain everything here in detail, but the basic, basic take home message is that kind of like balanced sampling is much faster than uniform sampling. And again, with the number of subsets, everything gets faster. So if you increase the number of subsets. Uh, similarly, for like preconditioning, so if like these graphs basically show you that if you do preconditioning, you are faster than doing uh, scalar step sizes. And again, kind of like this effect gets kind of stronger as you have uh, more and more subsets. Let's look at some more images to close. Um, so this was, was a slide that I showed you before with FPG imaging. So at the top, uh, the 5,000 iterations, at the bottom, the 20 epochs. But now we're interested in having a very fast algorithm. So now let's compare two different algorithms that have basically the same computation effort. So these are kind of like the deterministic one and the randomized one after 20 epochs both. And as you can see, the, uh, the bottom one looks pretty, uh, pretty close to the, uh, the solution that we actually want to reconstruct. At the top, we can see basically nothing. Uh, if we go to 10 epochs, then at the bottom, we can still get a very useful reconstruction at the top. So like uh, it's even like hard to even to see kind of like gray matter and white matter. And if you go down to five epochs at the bottom, it still looks good. At the top, there's hardly any outline. 
uh, in order to show you that I'm not, uh, I'm not cheating, kind of like after one epoch, so also here the randomized algorithm uh, hasn't really computed the settle point, but like after five uh, epochs is already pretty good. One can do the same for other traces like floor or bitter tier. The story is basically very similar. One thing that's a bit interesting here where it's a bit different, so kind of like the, the contrast here for floor bitter tier seems to have converged after, after 20 epochs uh, and not after five as before. However, interestingly, the structure of the pet image seems to have converged much quicker, although like the contrast itself ha hasn't converged yet between, let's say, like five and 10 epochs, structure is already pretty good. After one epoch, again, so we have a uh, pretty good structure, whereas the quantitative values are here are wrong. So they are just kind of, kind of still need to converge, need a few more epochs in order to converge. Great, so in order to conclude the talk, I've shown you a randomized algorithm which can make use of the separable structure of a problem. It's not really separable, but like it's almost separable. And we have seen that more subsets, balance sampling and preconditioning all speed up the conversion and they can all be used together. Uh, for clinical data, we've seen as uh, around 50 to 20 epochs were needed in order to do the reconstruction for clinical data, uh, which is kind of like a similar order of magnitude compared to like OSCM reconstruction, so that's good. And so in the future, uh, future groups will be along two lines. On the one hand, very practical. We actually collaborate with clinicians in order to see kind of like that with this algorithm, whether we can bring some of these mathematical, um, uh, uh, mathematical models into clinical practice. And the second part is, so the sampling is, a, is actually like a big open question. So I've, I've known kind of numerically compared two different samplings, uniform and balanced sampling, but there's no theory at all kind of like what is the best sampling. Uh, so like the, like the question is like, can we actually prove something like an optimal sampling in both cases? And the second part is kind of like at the moment the sampling is uh, uniform across iterations. Can we maybe have an ad uh, adaptive sampling to make an even faster algorithm? Thank you very much. <laughs>